One of the most important aspects in any real estate transaction where you need a loan is getting qualified and selecting the right loan officer, especially if you're buying a residential property, because this is the mortgage that you will be stuck with for your duration up to 30 years living in your home if you don't pay it off early. And like agents, there are so many people, so many cheerleaders out there that will give you bad and wrong information. And most people don't know to shop around. And a lot of times you end up with your loan officer because of your real estate agent and their relationship with this person. So in this video, I'm interviewing Stuart Epstein. He is a mortgage professional with over 20 years of experience. And he kind of digs in and tells you really what you should be doing, what you should be looking for as a consumer and making sure that you get the best deal with the loan origination, that you don't overpay on things like points and that your mortgage payment is as low as possible, at least with the interest rates and the time frame that you're making a buying decision and a lot of times these loan officers this really annoys me they'll say things like date the rate that you can always finance later and guys that's not necessarily true so i hope you enjoy the show Stuart. thanks so much for sitting down with me you know it's you you have one of those jobs that uh you know, from an agent standpoint, I mean, we get pounded on by you guys all the time, right? I mean, you can imagine that, I'm sure. Yeah, I've, I've heard from some of my realtor partners that they get a lot of phone calls from lenders. Yes. Like daily almost, but I know what you do isn't easy and um, it's a vital part of the transaction. I mean, it's very important that uh, agents kind of link up with loan officers that can put their, get the, the deal done, right? Get it to the finish line for their client. So. Um, how, tell everybody how long you've been in the business and sort of, you know, what your team dynamic looks like right now, because I mean, you've been in, you've been at this for a while. Yeah. So, so yeah, thanks Todd. I've, I've been in the mortgage business a little over 20 years and I got into the mortgage business. Um, I don't want to say by accident, but I was working as an accountant. I was working for an engineering firm, started there when I was 20 years old and kind of progressed, um, and advanced uh, with this uh, consulting engineering firm I was working for uh, to the point where I was uh, the controller for the company and I was 26, 27 years old. And I started getting really complacent. Uh, I bought my first house. So I think I was 28 when I bought my first house. My mortgage lender was a buddy of mine, really good friend of mine. And he looked out for me. But I also noticed some things when I bought my first house that I wasn't completely happy with. And I realized one day, like, this might be a business I could check out. Maybe I could get into the mortgage business. I inquired. I uh, had a few friends in the business, one of whom was my buddy who did my first mortgage. Uh, and I found a way to get into the business moonlighting. Uh, so I, I started out in the mortgage business around 28 years old as a part-time gig and quickly realized I was good at it. I enjoyed uh, a lot of the aspects of, of the business, interacting with people, helping people, et cetera, et cetera. And it took off from there. So within about a year and a half, I, I left my job with the engineering firm and, and went full force into the mortgage business and haven't looked back since. Yeah. That was the wall West. It was the early 2000s. So two, we're talking about 2002, 2003. And when I first got in the business, I remember hearing people in the office starting to talk about uh, SIVA loans, stated income, verified assets, or Nina loans. No income, no assets, right? So yes, that's the Wild West was just getting started at that point. And that was a time when loan officers did not need a license, correct? We did not. So when I interviewed for my first mortgage job, I went to the one of the owners of this. Um, it was a broker, a, a, a direct lender, but they were a correspondent lender. They weren't funding their own loans. And the owner sat down with me in the conference room. I showed him my resume. I didn't need a resume, but I, you know, you're interviewing for a job. I assume you should bring your resume with you, right? So at that point, um, they were really busy. They didn't have a training program. I told this gentleman, Rick, I wanted to get in the mortgage business. And he said, I see on your resume here, you're making X number of dollars a year. You're working for this company. It seems like you've got a great job. Why would you want to leave that? And I said, I don't. I just want to do this part time. And he kind of looked in wonder and said, all right, well, we'll buy you a box of business cards and you can have at it. 
That's how I got in the mortgage business. There was no training. There was no licensing, nothing. I was a mortgage lender. And then you watched complete chaos happen over the next several years, right? Until we hit the, what, about 2006, 2007. At what point did you realize, and it's amazing you went through all that, but at what point did you realize that things would get really bad? In terms of the business itself, so the, the folks that I followed when I got into the mortgage business and who mentored me kind of showed me the right way to do business. So first of all, I was targeting real estate agents and developing relationships with realtors. Um, I was told when I started, if I did a good job for my real estate agents, then they're like an annuity for me. And I knew what an annuity was. Annuity keeps paying. Right? Right. And if I do a good job, if I'm competent, if I answer the phone, if I get the deal done on time, um, then a, 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 that relationship will grow and that person will become like an annuity. Um, mostly a paper lending. Mostly for me, when I started out, I was still in my 20s. I was focused on first-time home buyers, first-time home buyer programs like the Maryland Mortgage Program. Uh, being a Baltimore City guy, I grew up in the city and always have had an affinity for Baltimore City. Uh, that's, that was a big target of mine. And most of those folks were first-time home buyers who need help. Um, so I really cut my teeth doing a paper lending. I really wasn't interested in these exotic mortgages or subprime mortgages where you can get somebody a loan after they've demonstrated no willingness to repay, meaning their credit was horrible or they didn't have the income or they didn't have the assets. Um, those loans and those, those products uh, existed, but I never really focused on them. So I was a little bit distanced from where the, the problem really was and how it was growing. What I started to see in 06 and 07, maybe a little bit before that, was people really tapping out the equity in their homes. So not only were people starting to be able to buy homes without being able to demonstrate the ability to repay, but they were also refinancing taking cash out, going out and buying the big screen TVs. You remember in the early 2000s, I mean, big screen TVs were a luxury. Flat, flat screen TVs were a luxury. Yeah, Not everybody had $300. Yeah, right? they were they four, were five, six thousand right. dollars yeah. Home entertainment systems, vacation homes, people were starting to, you could just see, you know, in our society, people were just finding that because home values were going up so rapidly because the demand was there and it was easy to get financing, so therefore, home values were going up. So existing homeowners were seeing this opportunity to say, oh, my home value is going up 100 grand. I'll take 50 grand in cash out, refinance, and go buy the house down at the beach or blow out my entertainment room in my house or whatever, right? Yeah. And what, what I started seeing was that just growing and that, that mentality growing. Um, Speaking of subprime lending, and that, that's a big cause of a lot of the, the, the meltdown in, the, in 2008, um, we had subprime investors, meaning subprime reps, coming into our office to do sales meetings to basically present their products to us who are on the front line who are selling the product. They were coming in and saying, okay, um, here's our qualifications for this product. You have to have three trade lines on your credit report, but two of them can be collections. So they were writing these guidelines that didn't make sense, right? You had to have three trade lines. A trade line is, a, is an account on your credit report, as you know, but two of them could be collections. So their advice, tell your client, don't pay off a collection because then that trade line will go away. So an open collection on your credit report was a good thing to subprime lending. That's just a small example. Yeah. That's <laughs> so, a, yes, yeah, it that's was a problem. Terrible. It was a problem. Yeah. yeah. How did you get through? I mean, you know, even though despite that you were building the relationships with the agent mm -hmm. and you were getting that annuity, um, you know, so to speak. And, and by that point, by the time, you know, we really started to see 07, 08 kick in, I mean, you had several years of some good success. How were you able, how, you know, how did you modify and how did you change when even the agents, because agents weren't doing business. I mean, if you were, a, if you position yourself as a bank REO, you know, real estate owned uh, agent, foreclosure agent or short sale specialist, that didn't help you. So how did you, you know, get through those times? Obsessive work ethic. 
so I was raised uh, youngest of I was the youngest of seven kids and and uh, in a modest household. Um, for whatever reason, I was I've all my entire life, you know, I've been obsessed with and and have had an obsessive work ethic. Uh, I think uh, that helped me through those years. Uh, but also the type of business. So first time home buyers, they're even through the meltdown, you know, 08 to 10, 11, there were a lot of first time home buyers in the market. And because I made myself an expert on the programs that help first time home buyers, I think there were plenty of times where I was really busy and a lot of my colleagues in the business weren't. They were just sitting there waiting for the phone to ring for the half a million or million dollar home buyer to come along who's maybe selling their house and buying another house or whatever. And I'm doing transactions. So um, whether it was, you know, intentionally strategy, you know, if I strategized that way when I got into the business, knowing that if the market slows down, I'm going to still have consistent business coming in. I don't think I necessarily thought that way, but I knew that a lot of people didn't want to focus on that business. When things are busy, a lot of lenders don't want to mess with the stuff that requires more work and more handholding, more guidance to the clients and so forth, because less you become a financial, less commission. Correct. So I think that helped me through those slower times because when people ask me, Hey, what was it like back in 08? I say, I had a pretty good year. You know, uh, it, it wasn't, it didn't feel like death to me. Yeah. So that's a good strategy. You know, that kind of leads me into this thought that how things are a little different today with affordability, <clears throat> you know, back and I was in the business back then too, in, in the great financial crisis at the peak of unaffordability was somewhere around 2006. That's where prices peaked out nationwide, but here in Maryland, despite the high price of 2006, the lack of affordability of 2006, the median income earner, could still afford a median income home. If we look at the housing affordability index, it was, if you look at the line of 100, meaning that the median earner can afford a median home, it remained above that line. So despite it being unaffordable then, it was still very, very affordable. The last several years, for our, especially for our first time home buyers, we have dipped down below that 100 line in the 90s, meaning that someone making a median income can no longer afford a median income home. How has, you know, that changed your opinion on where we are today? A lot of people, they want to say, you know, we'll never experience another housing market downturn. You know, they want to say that. I've been in the business since 1989. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was a builder. I swung a hammer. You know, I've been through a couple of these, right? Not anywhere near as big as the G GFC, but I've still seen downturns where evictions, you know, uh, or foreclosures were high, you know, uh, prices were tanking in specific markets in specific times of a decade. You know, what is your opinion now for those first time buyers now that the housing affordability index is awful? You hit the nail on the head. You know, the first time home buyer is, is probably the most challenged. Um, those who have owned for several years and have, you know, reaped the, the, the reward of, you know, uh, home values going up over the last several years, when they're in the market, they're going to have some assets to put down and they don't have to finance as much and they've got more flexibility with how they structure their financing. The first, the typical first time home buyer that's now what, between 27 and 37 years old, with the most number of people in that age range in history coming into that into this market and limited supply, increasing home prices, interest rates not near the bottom. It's a huge challenge for the first time home buyer. So what from my perspective, you know, on the ground level, what I'm seeing is people are having to compromise something. Maybe they can't buy in the neighborhood that they really want to be in. Maybe they have to expand their search geographically a little bit. Um, maybe they can't have everything that they want in a home this go round. Maybe they have to think about this home being, as most of us probably did when we were you know, buying our first house. I remember you know, the townhome I bought in Parkville, Maryland, 
you know, for $126,000 was not everything I wanted, but I wanted to get in the game. I wanted to become a homeowner. I wanted to start getting the benefits of, of the tax benefits of build, you know, building appreciation of quality of life. You know, all the, all the reasons why uh, we want to be homeowners in, in the United States of America. The challenge really, I think, is finding balance. I think when this market finds balance, and I think that's something as professionals in this industry, we all kind of wish for, you know, is a healthy balance. And it just makes it easier to help people, makes it easier to do business, get people to the table and accomplish their goals. So I don't have the answer, right? Because this is a challenge that I think we're going to continue to face. Lack of inventory and affordability. How do we fix that? I might need your help on that one. Yeah, well, I think, uh, I mean, I, I think the only way that we can look at it is home prices need to come down. Something has to break, right? We either need a drastic cut in red tape for to cut down development costs. I mean, I was just having a conversation with someone this morning that was talking about, you know, uh, hard goods, the hard cost of building a house really how does that go down right now? I don't know that it can, you know, um, because if you're timbering, you know, uh, trees for construction lumber, their regulations aren't getting any easier. So, you know, their costs are higher and, and so forth. So I think what's going to happen is going to, the battle's going to be out in the, in the field of, you know, who will work for less or what builders will take less money or more narrow margins in order to move the inventory, because I don't think that we can, despite everybody saying, you know, hey, if rates go down to your business, rates go down with a five in it, Barbara Corcoran, you know, we're gonna see prices skyrocket and we're gonna get 20%. <laughs> um, I, I think that we're beyond all that because what I saw happen during the pandemic era was parents were, and you saw this, were giving gift money to their kids so that they could even get in that game, right? That they can spend 50,000 over appraised value or, you know, have the down payment money that helped them get to a payment to where they were comfortable affording. But I don't think mom and dad realized that the HVAC system would break. And now that's $25,000 and, or the roof needs to be replaced. So it is interesting times. Um, what do you think about, you know, a couple of things I want to pull out um, and obviously, you know, um, timing, depending on when somebody's listening to this video, but we're looking at interest rates right now that are probably around the average of a five decade running average. This is not bad rates, right? Right. Do you think that we will ever get to a point in time again where the Federal Reserve steps in and does something as stupid as they did the last go round? or the last two go rounds by dropping rates to where the bond rates mirrored that. And then they started buying mortgage backed securities to get the mortgages below 4%. You think we'll ever see that again? I would not predict that we would see to that extent. I think if the affordability issue continues, it becomes a political issue. You know, it becomes, it becomes uh, an issue that affects everybody really, you know, in our nation, because the economy around real estate drives, you know, real estate drives the U.S. economy. <laughs> Let's face it. If first-time home buyers, I think, I think there's a lot of things that can happen. Repurposing of commercial space, you know, some of these in, in metropolitan, you know, areas, Baltimore City, let's take, for example, um, some of these buildings getting repurposed to condominiums, you know, as opposed to apartments or office space. You know, I think, these are the types of things that, that people, the innovative people are looking at right now. Do you think these people want to be in an apartment, a glorified apartment? I mean, no, no offense to people living in a condominium, yeah. but I mean, you think these young people that are growing up want to have dogs and backyards and kids want to be in a, you know, with a, you know, in an apartment building with someone right. over top of them and someone beneath them and the partying and the, I mean, that's, yeah. that, that, that to me is not, I don't think that's a good solution. <laughs> no, I don't think it's the solution. No, yeah. no. But I think just thinking in that, in that way, thinking outside of the box in, in terms of how, because to your point, uh, my observation since, since the pandemic um, is that the labor market's tougher. Um, the, the mentality of, of the, the average worker is different. 
Um, people demand more flexibility. People want to work from home. People, you know, people want to have a job, but they're not necessarily committed to that job. They have three or four side hustles, side hustles you know, yeah. and, and, and I see more of the, the generation, you know, after us, um, you know, the, the generation that's in their twenties right now thinking differently. Yeah. And I um, agree with that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and, and that's, that has an impact on, on everything too, the cost of doing business. Talk about the lures that, um, you know, uh, I call them lures because I don't like them. Uh, I watched how it ended so badly for millions and millions of American people that wanted to buy a house back in the day where they went in interest only, for instance, or a balloon type of payment um, where it pushes them in a situation where they have to be, they have to refinance. So when we look at, you know, the trickery that's going on in, in the industry with the, the three, two, one buy downs and the variable rates or the arms. I mean, I, I guess I kind of set you up for that one, but I mean, yeah. it, it, you know, what, what is your opinion of that? And where do people get in trouble using those types of products? The, the temporary buy down that you, you mentioned, and I know you know this, it's, it's literally just prepaying interest for the first two, one, two, or three years. We have a, we have a one, one buy down. We have a two, one buy down and a three, three, two, one buy down. Um, and we offer them on FHA loans, VA loans, conventional loans. It's a great option for somebody that it fits. And here's where the expertise, the, cons- the, the understanding numbers, not just being a salesperson, I'm talking about in my, in my world, actually being able to consult with people and, and help them decide if something like that is actually going to help them. I'll give you an example. Let's say we have somebody who uh, is a doctor, okay, but they're in their first couple years, they're doing their residency or whatever, and they're making 60 grand a year. Now they know for a fact, unless they do something really stupid or unforeseen, you know, something out of their control happens in a couple of years, they're going to be making six figures and probably pretty good six figures. And they want to get into a house, the payments kind of, you know, on the $350,000 house that they want to buy just kind of affects their cash flow a little too much today to make them comfortable. Um, and they're looking at a house that the seller's motivated. And this might not be the case uh, for the most part still today because of lack of inventory, but the seller's willing to concede something. You know, historically or traditionally, it would be closing cost help, okay, for the person, for the buyer that needs, needs help with closing. Instead, they say, look, we're going to contribute, um, and on a 2-1 buy-down, it might be about 2.231% or whatever. Explain so, what in so, dollars, a half a million dollar house. Yeah, so, so let's say it cost $15,000 to buy down for two years to buy down the interest rate, 2% in the first year below the starting rate. So let's say rates are at 7%, okay? A 30-year fixed is at 7%. In year one, their interest rate's gonna be 5%. In year two, it's gonna be 6%. And then in year three and forward for the next 27 years or until they refinance or sell the house, it's that 7% rate. But to help them be more comfortable today while their income is a little bit lower knowing and feeling confident that that's going to change. Okay. That's not true for everybody. That's, that's a scenario where a temporary buy down might make sense. You just laid out the best scenario <laughs> that I've heard explained yet. And you, and, and I understand that. I, I think you nailed it with that. I think if in that scenario with a doctor in residency and knows unless they screw up in three years, their salary will be you know, double or triple what it is today, as so long as they can still afford those payments as they're being qualified for today in three years, if they're not making another dollar more and they're comfortable with that, that that's a great scenario. Um, how about for everybody else? What about for these builders that are just luring these buyers in with these, you know, this three, two, one buy down, um, telling them that they can just refinance in three years? Yeah. The better solution, and I've seen builders offering the temporary buy-down, uh, and builders, as you know, because you, you are a builder or we're a builder, um, will typically build into the price of the home these concessions that they're offering, okay? And it's, it's a sales tactic, just like when you're purchasing a car and there's a rebate sticker on the car. It's already built into the price of the home, right, or the car in that case. So the temporary buy-down is, is to me, a little bit gimmicky to offer just 
as a general incentive to anybody, right? It doesn't make sense for everybody. Again, it's just prepaying interest. It's not actually saving you money. It's not like paying points to buy down your rate permanently. So what I'm seeing and what we're doing actually at CMG, we have a product called um, the spec lock. What this does is it allows us to contribute and the builder to contribute to a permanent rate buy down. So let's say a builder on a $500,000 house has 25 grand earmarked. Well, let's say 15 grand earmarked as a concession to a buyer to incentivize that buyer to buy their home. So what they're doing is saying, well, we're going to do a spec lock program here with CMG. We're going to contribute that 15,000. That's three points. Okay. Possibly more depending on how much the buyer's putting down, but it's at least three points of buy down. CMG as a partner, and when we work with our builders, this is our contribution to the table is we add one more percent to that. So it's really a four-point buy-down. This is what's allowing builders to advertise legitimately because these are locked loans. These aren't just, well, let's see what the market does and we'll give you somewhere around this rate. These are locked-in rates at the four and a half, five percent. But just explain to people because four points doesn't really mean four percentage points. It does not. So if you're talking about a seven percent and you're doing a four percent, they're not getting a three percent. They're not getting three percent. But they so could be getting over that. They could be getting five, five and a half. It gets complicated to explain the margins that uh, on the on the mortgage securities market, um, a mortgage loan basically has a value, right, at an interest rate, and at let's say a par value or a 100, I'll call it value at 7%, at 6.5%, it costs money, okay, to buy that interest rate. Now, a half percent might be, and, and again, this is where it gets tricky because the market's not consistent. I can't sit here and give you a chart and say one point's going to get you this on every loan. Um, so th let's say three points is probably going to buy you a full percent if not more, okay. down in rate. So if it's seven at three points, we'll get you to six, yeah. which is fair enough. Yeah. Um, in my world, um, being on the sales side of things, I've seen where, uh, and, and this is a lot of frustration too, by the way, uh, because I think um, a lot of real estate brokers, I think in, in general, and this I'm just going to sort of jump the rail for a minute, but in general, generally speaking, I think that brokerages have, in a lot of ways, failed the industry by making the real estate agent the client. And I just heard a very big broker in a conference just say those exact words, that the agents were their client. They have 30,000 agents. Mm -hmm. What they've done is by giving everything to the agent, they've put their reputation or the client, who is, to me, the most important aspect of the transaction, the buyer or seller, they've let that agent sort of the Wild West manage their reputation to their client um, instead of being in control of that customer satisfaction. But what they've done to make money is these brokers have gone into mortgage. Where I come from, when you get out of your game and get into someone else's game, you become fair game, right? <laughs> And I think you guys have picked up a little bit of a bad rap maybe because of this, um, you know, where, you know, we, we, we've watched real estate brokers have been enticed to start their, I mean, they've come after me. Hey, own your own mortgage company. This is great. You can pick up all this extra money, right? What has that done to your business? And what is your opinion on that? Is that a bad practice? I mean, you take somebody like you that is 20 years in business, 22, yeah. 22 mm -hmm. years coming, you know, you've been in it for a while. And and then these agents are incentivized or enticed. I mean, it's illegal. They can't make them send the business to the in-house mortgage. mortgage company, right? There's all kinds of disclosures that need to be made, but we know what happens. But they end up incentivizing them. Hey, you're giving me everything here. I'm going to send them that way. How's that affected your business and how is that either good or bad for the buyer? It's ultimately bad for the buyer because the way I describe it is there's, if you have a pizza and there's eight slices of pizza and there's 10 people that want a slice, there's not enough pizza for everyone, right? So the cost is going to have to go up. So if, if we're working together, I'm a mortgage lender 
you're the real estate agent, and let's forget about the legal part of this because it's illegal, okay, for me to give kickbacks or to incentivize you in any way to send me business. Okay, there's rules around all this, as we all know, and we have to do a lot of continuing education and compliance, and there's a lot of regulatory oversight around this stuff. However, there's a lot of smart people in our industry that can find the loopholes and find ways around it. I've heard stories recently about mortgage lenders hiring a real estate agent or broker on their payroll as a non-producing manager, okay? So they bring the person on, they have to pay that salary, right? So that's a cost to their business. They have to pay them. And by the way, you're gonna be sending all your clients to us to do the mortgage, right? So that's just basically a workaround to the rules, okay? But ultimately, the lender's gonna have to pay your salary. And what's that mean? I'm gonna have to charge a higher interest rate. And if you're in this industry, you know that in a lot of cases, those lenders are not competitive. Now, they're counting on the consumer trusting them. They're counting on their real estate agent trusting or trusting their agent, trusting the lender that they're looking out for them, that they are giving them the best deal. Now, in today's world, thankfully, the consumer can shop and there's a lot of resources out there. But like you said... When they don't know somebody and they're trusting their agent, their agent saying, hey, use this person. Right. And, you know, if you're paying 7% when the market's at 6.625 or 6.75 and the fact that you're paying 7% is so that your realtor can make a couple extra bucks, to me, that's, no, that's not good for our business. To me, it's unethical. Um, as long as I've been in the business, there are things like that happening. Um, do I think that they're happening wholesale? Do I think that they're happening as a majority of the business? Not at all, not yeah. at all. In desperate times, people take desperate measures and they try to squeeze a nickel from wherever they can. Yeah. And that's, that's when you see these types of things happening, which we're in right now, right? Yeah. We're that's in that how, market where people have been struggling <laughs> for, for business. Um, ultimately, uh, and I, you know, we can, we can uh, this conversation can go very philosophical, but the reason that we're acquainted with each other, right? We have the same business mindset. Um, it's the client first, right? So no matter what I'm doing, whether it's a relationship I have with a real estate broker and how we're generating business together, how we're providing value and synergistic, uh, you know, benefit to our clients and everything. Um, if it's money first, it's probably not a good decision especially if we're thinking our money, right? Not the client's money. Uh, I was telling a new agent I had breakfast with the other day. She's just getting started. And I said, look, you have the work ethic. You have the personality. You care about people. Like I, in 30 minutes, I, I figured all that out about this, this, this woman. Um, she's going to be great as a real estate agent. Um, she's got a big heart. I said, put the client first and their interest first. Never think about the commission if, if, if all you're thinking about in the back of your mind is that commission that you may lose or may not lose, or how do I make sure I get that commission, you're going to make bad decisions for your client. If you always put the client first and their interest first, you're going to be hugely successful because people figure that out. And, and you know, your reputation is everything, right? And your reputation is a result of how you conduct your business and how you take care of people. And most of us work on referral. So we rely on the people that we serve to say, hey, you got to call Stu. He's going to take care of you. So what do you say to the agent that, um, you know, maybe they're not new. Maybe they just haven't done a whole lot of transactions. I mean, obviously, we all go through frustration, you know, dealing with people that don't know. And and um, and of course, you get thrown under the bus probably a lot, you know, when when things go wrong, because it's never the agent's fault. Right. It's never communication or whatever on the agent or what have you what what do you say to the agent to say look you're in the business you know this is the way that you should treat the lending side the mortgage side what are some of the things that you find yourself repeating over and over and over again or seeing some of the mistakes the agents that are making that they could do just a couple things differently to make the transaction go way better I think it's the same as, as what I think are the things that are important for us on the lending side. I think it's, it's honest communication, responsiveness, 
um, just what we were talking about in, in terms of the you know doing what's in the best interest of the client, no matter what, even if it means the deal goes south. You know, I, I don't really put a lot of demands on my my realtors. It's it's more the other way around. Um, I want to know from my realtor partners what's going to help them so that they can go out and sell more houses. Because ultimately, that's you know my job is to make sure I take care of their clients that they refer to me. They get to settlement on time. They're happy. I've done my job. And that I haven't tasked them with, hey, I need you to do this, this, and this to get this deal done. If I need my realtor to do something that is not part of my you know, process, by all means, I'm going to call them and say, hey, can you call Mrs. Smith? Because I've asked her six times to give me that last bank statement because she got a gift and she just... Yeah, and we're and we're settling next Tuesday. Would you mind giving her a call for me? Because I've tried six times. That's about that's about yeah. it. What um, about as far as you know, making sure that they're pre qualified before they go out? And, oh, hundred percent. You know, calling you at seven o'clock at night on a Friday night saying that they need a you know a pre qualification letter, a pre approval letter in the next hour, or yeah. they're going to lose the deal because they weren't prepared or yeah. something like that. I mean, I guess that's kind of you know, are those types of tips that you know you think would be. <laughs> you know, helpful. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So these, these are the things that sometimes I forget they, they need to be repeated. Right. So, right. Cause I'm thinking right. while you're saying, I'm thinking, doesn't everybody already know that? Right. Right. No, but they don't. Right. So <laughs> no. uh, yeah, no, thanks for mentioning that. So, um, of course, so, so Todd, you call me on a Friday night and say, Hey, look, I've got Mr. and Mrs. Smith here with me. They haven't been pre-approved yet. Um, oh, by the way, they're self-employed. They had a bankruptcy three years ago, but they want to put an offer on this house and the deadline's 10 o'clock tonight. And what do I do? I put a smile on my face and say, Todd, no problem. Let's, let's get this done, right? But then I talk to them and I find out that they haven't filed their taxes in two years and you know, so on and so forth. And then the conversation goes, hey, look, if you really want to purchase a home, like there's some steps here that we need to take. And you need to be prepared for this because the next house that comes up, and if you're in the same emergency situation, we're going to be in the same position where you can't, your financing's not ready yet. Yeah. You know, so I think it's, when I have that, I'll usually um, very politely, you know, educate the client and the agent. If the agent has unrealistic expectations, most experienced agents that I work with don't have unrealistic expectations. They know. And I'll be politely honest about it, right? Because one of the biggest mistakes that I've seen my colleagues over the years do, ones who I've worked with personally and ones who I've seen out there in the marketplace that you know I haven't worked with directly, is they're afraid. They let fear drive how they conduct their business. So they'll tell somebody yes before they know it's a yes. They haven't overturned, they haven't you know uncovered all the... Um, possible landmines in the client's financials and maybe they are not 100% sure how to calculate the income because it's a little complicated and they go and they're afraid if they say no or not yet that that agent's never going to call them again with another referral because they didn't come through. So there's a balance there between, you know, obviously you have to know your craft, have the, you know, experience helps. I've been made fun of when I say I have 20 years in the business by people with five. Oh, I hate hearing that. Well, guess what? I've got 20 years of experience with different scenarios, you know, that maybe they, the, the person that has two or three years hasn't. I'm not being critical of the person with two or three years, but experience hey, does matter. It does matter. You know, been there and done that. Uh, know how to handle it. So, um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's really about setting expectations and being realistic with people and being honest, even if, even if it's not the answer they want to hear. Because what's worse than being a week away from settlement and having a lender call you and say, we have a problem. Houston, I, we have a problem. And I think going, they do well, intentionally you know? sometimes. They, I mean, <laughs> I think that, you know, they avoid, I mean, I've had it. We're bad lenders, you know, where these people, they're not getting we're all the way down to the finish line and and i don't think that they were qualified right from the beginning and you know and the deal falls apart and and what a lot of people don't realize and why i think it's so critical that an agent or a client somebody listening you know needs to understand your lender is a big part of the transaction i mean they can really screw up your world and screw up everybody else's world too because these are sellers you know they have lives too i mean they're they want to move down the road they're making their plans they're making their arrangements and 
you know, and we we've seen some deals fall apart where it was in, you know, where we had been on the listing side, had the buyer deal fall apart. Say, wait a minute, it's falling apart. Okay, well, let's get them qualified with somebody that we know, and then we send them to who we know, and they go, "There's these people shouldn't even be under contract." I mean, this is a wing and a prayer, and 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 that's not part of the equation. So, you know, I think that there needs to be, Stuart, there just needs to be so much education, which is why we do this, because people really need to understand that they're real lives, real people, and they're real processes that need to be steps that need to be taken to, to make sure somebody's really making a good decision and buying a home, I guess is the, is the bottom line. So, um, yeah, I mean, all your information is published down below in the show notes. Uh, anything, final thoughts you want to add that we didn't cover? I mean, we went all over the place. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I love these conversations, honestly, uh, Todd, and, and I appreciate, you know, the friendship and partnership that we have. I think the good people in our industry are what make it, you know, enjoyable and, and tolerant at times, right? And uh, it, it really is, it's, it's a great industry to be in because what are we doing? We're helping people achieve the dream of home ownership, you know, and, and the first thing I do when I sit down with new clients is I say, tell me your goals, you know, tell me, tell me what you, what you want to accomplish here. And I write it down and I save it and we put it in our OneNote uh, file and I refer back to it until they, until that Keep client is under point. contract on a home. So I don't forget yeah. what's important to them. I want to know what's important to my client. So I think... You know, for anybody out there that's listening to this, whether you're a real estate agent, whether you're a, a future home buyer, maybe you're a real estate investor, I don't care. These principles are the most important thing that matter in this business. And, um, and that's what I stick to. And that's why I still have the energy I have for this business after the time that I've been doing it. Yeah, well said. And I don't think I'm going to quit anytime soon. So. Uh, me either. <laughs> no me matter either. what the market does. Right, I may right? end up flipping hamburgers or something <laughs> one day, but no, no I'm, I'm, I'm not planning on going away either. Thanks so much. Thank you, Todd. Well, what did you think about Stuart? You can drop your comments below. And guys, if you like the video or got a little bit of information that you can use, you can let Stu and I know that you enjoyed the video by smashing that thumbs up. And if you haven't subscribed to our channel, what are you waiting for? Take a moment, do so now. Hit that alert bell. You'll know every time we upload content just like this. See you next time. Sachs Realty, Maryland Broker, number 607720, office number 443-318-4514, equal housing opportunity.